Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, peace be upon you all. Welcome to our show discussing the different aspects of the story of Karbala that took place on Ashura. One of the most beautiful sights a human being can look at is the epic, beautiful pilgrimage of Arabain that takes place every single year. Regarded as the largest peaceful gathering that takes place on this earth, this journey of love, of loyalty, of compassion, and of grief as well, is one of the most striking images we can see uh, as human beings and one of tr the true wonders of the world. Today's show, we're going to discuss the origin of this pilgrimage as well as what it shows about uh, human values in the religion of Islam. We're going to look at this with our guest today. We've got Sayyid Ali Nawab with us, we've got Sayyid Mohsin Shah and Ibrahim Ansari to provide some poetry and look at the discussion as well. Uh, Sayyid now, the biggest pilgrimage in the world, not just pilgrimage, gathering in the world, maybe only rivaled by the one um, the Hindus do in the Ganges River every few years. But before we go into what happens on this pilgrimage every single year, I want to go into the origin of it. Two questions. The number 40. Why is 40 days after Ashura this has happened? Because 40 is quite a common number. And where did the origin of this pilgrimage start from? Who was the first person to do this pilgrimage to Karbala? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Wa lanatullahi ala a'dahim ajma'in ila abadil abidin. Allahumma salla ala muhammad wa ala muhammad. The number 40... If we go back and just have a general look over the riwayat and narrations of Ahlul Bayt السلام, the first thing that comes to our mind uh, or the first thing that we find is that the number 40 is used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards with the uh, prophethood and the, the, mes uh, the prophethood of the prophets and the messengers where the majority of the prophets and the messengers and the uh, the closest example I can give was Prophet of Allah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. When he reached the age of 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him to prophethood. Why 40? Riwayats explain that uh, the uh, human mind, as it's been uh, created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it reaches the age of 40, it reaches the completion in terms of wisdom. Yes. So the prophets, when they reach the age of 40, they reach that level of completion and that level of wisdom. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hence sent them to prophethood. Does that mean that they weren't wise before that or they weren't complete before that? No. This is just a... Uh, a rough example Allah wanted to give mankind is that generally speaking when you reach the age of 40 you should be uh, reaching the complete wisdom there's no more wisdom to reach after that so, which means that one should uh, take care or look after his uh, nurturing his knowledge his experience so by the time he reaches 40 there is no more room for you to make mistakes so you should be uh, concentrating from then onwards from finalizing your stay on the face of this earth so this is why the name the number 40 came about and also we have a riwayah in regards with the ziyarat of Imam Hussein alayhi salam a riwayat uh, from Imam al-Askari alayhi salam when he says one of the alaim one of the signs of the mu'min is wa ziyaratul arba'in mm -hmm. Arba'een, here some say Arba'een, Ziyarat Arba'een Mu'min, visiting 40 Mu'min, okay. or naming 40 individuals in Salat al-Layl, for example. But ulama, uh, when they came to discuss this riwayah, they say Ziyarat to Arba'een, Arba'een al-Imam al-Husayn, mm -hmm. visiting Imam Hussein on his 40th. Mm -hmm. And who was the first to, do, to start this tradition then? And the first to visit Imam al-Husayn, alayhi salam, or to arrive to the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in that period was Jabir ibn Abdullah yes. al-Ansari. Of course, it coincided with the arrival of the camp on the caravan yes. of Imam Zain al-Abidin and the women and the children that were with him. So, generally speaking, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari uh, took him that much time to be able to get himself to come to Karbala 
and to arrive next to the burial site of Imam Hussein Ali Salam on the 40th. And the, of course, he is one of the greatest narrators of the narrations of Ahlul Bayt Ali Salam. But the narration of Imam al-Askari is the strongest one in regards with the, mm. the visitation of Imam Hussein on his 40th. Yeah, thank you. Sayyid Mohsen, why is the ziyara a sign of a believer? It's not just, I mean, the ziyara is, is you know, coming, saying that the ziyara is a sign of a believer, it's not just that you're going to pay your respects, but it's also that to recognize the status of Imam Hussein. It's also to recognize who the Imam was, to recognize the rights of the Imam. Also, it's to recognize what happened on that day of Ashura and to recognize that there was, you know, haq against batil. There was good versus evil. There was God versus, you could say, desires of man, or you could say the devil himself. Yes. So, you know, going for ziyara, being a sign of believer, it's not just actually performing the amal and, and for you to just, you know, go and do this walk, and but it's also to recognize who the Imam was, recognize the real status of an Imam, and then also to recognize the Imam of your time and recognize the rights of the Imam of your time. Mm. So, you know, th these add on to um, how, why the ziyarah is so important mm. and why it is significant for a moment to be there and for a person to actually go out of his way to go, go, go see Imam Hussein, you know, Absolute. being a symbol. Absolutely. You said it's a, a, a lord to the Imam of our time. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the Imam of our time actually goes to the pilgrimage as well, doesn't he? 100%. So we, we, if, you, if you are able to go, you are with him in, in, in the same crowd, inshallah. Uh, Ibrahim, from your perspective, what do you think and what are the etiquettes and how should one conduct themselves when going on the ziara? Because, you know, times have changed. We've got phones now. People film things and all that. But in, in, in general, what are some of the etiquettes of the ziara um, that you know of? So, um, as the Sayyid uh, mentioned, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, the first to arrive to the land of Karbala, and although he is not a, uh, uh, an Imam himself, however, he lived with the Prophet and five Imams. Okay. Um, so his knowledge and his etiquette is definitely of a great status. Um, so, when we look at the narration of him attending Karbala, the first thing he says is because he was blind, he said, take me to the river of Furat mm. and he washed his body. And then the narration says he wore the purest of his clothes and he put the most beautiful, what we call today, a perfume. Yes. Okay. So before he went to Ziyara. So one thing to actually keep in mind is to actually go in the best way we can. Let's wear clean clothes. Um, we wash ourselves. The 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 ghusl before ziyara is very highly recommended. Yes. Even outside of Arba'in, normal. Even if even today at home, if you want to perform ziyara to Karbala, a beautiful thing to do is, for example, to do ghusl of of, of ziyara. Although we can't actually be there, mm, the intention. The intention would be there, inshallah, and then we can recite the ziyara mm. of Imam Hussein. So. Quite interesting, sorry, uh, that um, because you made a very good point there. When we meet somebody important, we wear perfume, best yeah. clothes, and we get clean as possible. And meeting the one of the most important people, so the external part is very important too. Definitely. Yeah. So then you walk towards this holy site, towards this holy grave. The way you walk should show where you are truly walking to. The way you walk. The, the, the way you talk should mm. show where you are actually truly heading to. And likewise, you said with an important person, if I see, for example, uh, yourselves respected people and I see you and I come through that door, I will not walk in like a hooligan. I will make mm. sure to walk properly, um, address you properly, and this, the same should be done with Sayyidah Shuhada. Mm. And leaving aside, especially when reaching the holy land of Karbala, and you know, it's a very beautiful sight for those who have been to Arba'in. The moment you reach Karbala from uh, the side of Najaf, and the first thing you see is the dome of Abel Fadl al Abbas. Awesome. The moment you see that, shut everything off yeah. and yeah. make sure that mm. one thing is kept in mind, Absolutely. which is your ziyara. Absolutely. Um, Sayyid, now let's go uh, post Jabir um, and look at the Imams of Ahlul Bayt themselves. Um, 
did they ever perform the ziyara on Arbain or in other times of the year? Um, and what did they say about the importance of this? So Jabir we've got. What about the actual Imams themselves? Of course, um, before the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the messengers of Allah and the prophets of Allah, they did ziyara of Karbala. Mm, of course. One by one, prophets from Prophet Adam until Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and to Amir al Mu'mineen and the rest of the Imams, they did the ziyarah of Karbala. Amir al Mu'mineen visited Karbala when he was coming back from one of the battles, hmm. and he was noticed to take a bit of sand or soil from the earth and start smelling it, and then he said the following statement. He said, what a land that a group of people are going to be killed on, on it and their blood will be shed and they are going to, buy, to be killed by a deviant group of people. Mm. So hence, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Holy Prophet and the prophets before, historically they uh, made sure that they visited Karbala. The sunnah of the prophets. Because they know that on this land mm. there be a man who will be killed and martyred in a brutal manner, standing for the justice. Mm. Hence, uh, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam uh, came to bury the bodies of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam and visited his father Imam Hussein. And then Imam Al Baqir alayhi salam also, Imam Sadiq, he used to come. And there is a specific place in Karbala just behind the maqam of Imam Sahib Zaman, Ajar Allah Ta'ala Farjo Sharif, they called Maqam Al Imam Sadiq. Yes. Imam Sadiq used to come wash in the river of Furat yes. and pray and reside in that location. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are other locations in and around Karbala where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt used to take as a place of residence uh, for the short period of time where they used to do visitations. And not forgetting, we just brought the name of the Maqam of Imam Mahdi. Imam yeah. Mahdi, he himself, mm -hmm. he was observed to go and reside in that location and go visit his mm -hmm. grandfather Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And be sorry, before we get to the poetry, I want to ask about one narration and this comes up quite a lot. There's some narrations that talk about the ziyara Imam Hussein being greater than a Hajj and Umrah um, or the reward of it anyway. And especially for those from outside the, the world of Shiism, they might find that a bit problematic or very, very concerning. And even some Shias, I've, I've find that quite troubling. So can you explain what the Imams mean by such narrations? Uh, the Imams alayhim salam, when they come to encourage Mu'mineen to go and visit Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they want to bring the thawab or try to explain the level of thawab one Mu'min would get once they visit Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And uh, in those days they couldn't uh, come and say, uh, use a, a specific figure of number, say like, uh, uh, you would get this amount of, amount of money or this amount yes. of gold. They would give uh, the Hajj, for example, because Hajj at that time was one of the greatest of A'mal. Mm. Okay. There is the Mu'mineen and the Muslims, they didn't have anything greater than Hajj. Yes. So the Imams alayhi salam, alayhi salam when they said uh, visiting Imam Hussein, in the first instance they said it's greater than uh, going to Hajj and Umrah, performing Hajj and Umrah with Rasulullah. And then the person asking said, greater than Hajj and Umrah, Ibn Rasulullah? Imam, Imam said, Bal I will make it more <laughs> greater than 10 Hajj and 10 Umrah. And the person again asked, Ibn Rasulullah, greater than 10 Hajjs and 10 Umrah with Rasulullah? The Imam continued saying, Bal wa Umrah. The Imam continued increasing until he said, Alf Alf Hajj. A million Hajj and a million Umrah. Now, does that say mean to say that, okay, I don't go to Hajj. Hajj is wajib upon me. Mm. Every Mu'min, every Muslim has to go to Hajj once in their lifetime. Does that mean that I go to visit Imam Hussein alayhi salam and that means that I've done a million Hajj and a million Umrah. But I don't know. I don't need to go to Hajj mm -hmm. No. Imam alayhi salam says, um, Hajj wa Umrah mustahab. Your Hajj wajib, you have to go. But if you want to get the reward of going to Hajj a thousand times and going to Umrah a thousand times alongside the Holy Prophet of Islam, now you can imagine 
how complete that Hajj and that Umrah would be, mm. and how much Tawab you would get, then go to visit the grave of Ram. So it's a way of quantifying the, 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 the reward Ahsen. blessing of it. Okay, Ahsen. okay, Ahsen. interesting. Ahsen. Thank you. Um, as per usual, with the format of the show, we're going to have uh, some poetry, by Brother Ibrahim, uh, about this topic itself. Um, so, uh, on a day of day like Arba'in, we remember what Hussein truly called for. So, a poem written by Basim al Ansari called Hussein's Call. Hussein issued a call to be humane. It is calling us to be virtuous and sane, to be for good and from bad to refrain, calling for a way to end all brutal pain. So when you hear us crying, Hussein, know that he is beyond a love in our vein. Hussein is a path for glory and gain. He is a formula breaking every chain. Integrity and sacrifice of Hussein, a way to oppose every tyrant's reign, to face tyranny with patience, not deign, to be peaceful yet full of might. Like rain, Hussein and peace are indeed a twain. He attracts millions to Karbala, his fane, to learn from his ways, to learn from his ways and strength to attain, to be determined and truthful like Hussein, to be determined and truthful like Hussein. Thank you very much. Uh, Sayyid Mohsin, I now want to go into the actual pilgrimage itself, and luckily we've been on the pilgrimage uh, uh, itself. Uh, one of the most striking things for me when I've been on the pilgrimage is the way the people there, this the status they see you as. And truly, I'm nothing, but <coughs> when I'm walking uh, down that road, I feel like a king because of what they call me and how they see me, mm -hmm. the way they're begging the walkers to come and eat some food or even a foot massage. Um, so my question is, what is the actual status of a Zawar, a pilgrim of Imam Hussein? Because clearly, if you are on this pilgrimage, these people see you as you've dropped from heaven. Uh, and getting I mean, blessings from you. It's, it's not just that you guys are Zawar, but it's like you lot are the guests of Abba Abdullah. Yes. And, and the, we know that Iraqi people are very, very hospitable. Generous, yes. Guests. You know I mean? As soon as you enter, there's, there's, there's tea and there's food and there's, there's so much. So imagine being the guest of Abba Abdullah Hussein. And then imagine that you know, you're, you're walking down and then all these more caves, all these different, different you know, uh, groups of people have come to like um, give and to, 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 to serve and, and to help you on your on, and aid you. I, mean, I don't know about you guys, but I get stopped and invited into people's houses. Mm, yes. and, and I mean, my Arabic is not that strong, but they don't care. <laughs> They're like, you know, it doesn't matter. They're grabbing my hand and trying to pull me into people's houses. Um, there's non-stop tea <laughs> and um, water, especially like clean water. So for people who are a bit afraid or they mm. think that, oh, there's not fresh water, there's so much available, um, non-stop food. It's probably the biggest gathering of, of food in, in the world, mm. honestly, and the people there, that it's like they they will sacrifice anything and everything to make sure you are comfortable. Mm. And it's really really humbling that some of these people have nothing. Some nothing. of these people save all year mm. just for that moment, mm. so that they can serve. Mm. Ibrahim, why is it so important to serve the pilgrim and the guest of Imam Hussein? Now, to um, you see, just generally speaking, aiding someone in their ibadah, of course. aiding someone in um, or helping someone uh, to better themselves, to make them stronger, so by giving them nutrition to pray, giving them nutrition to make sure, um, uh, like during uh, suhoor time for example, to make sure they can fast the day, that has unbelievable amounts of reward. And likewise here, giving them a place to rest, giving them some nutrition to make sure that they can carry the walk to Abu Abdullah al Hussein, you will get the walk for every step they take, inshallah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite interesting, just just me witnessing that although the the Arabain is actually a, it's an event of grief, but we can't help smile at what happens there because you can only smile at the generosity that's shown there. Uh, Say, what about your experience? Um, you've been as well. Um, what sticks out for you the most on this walk or even the, the atmosphere? <sighs> One is mesmerized where to start with the, yes. the images that they see in Narbaeen. But um, the first thing I would see is that the amount of love people mm. have. You can't imagine, you can't describe the amount of love they have. 
You don't know these individuals. They are young and old. They sit in the middle of the road, on the floor, on the sand and on the dust with their, you know, the, the Arabs, the Iraqis, especially those who wear the, the specific agar, they say. They have honor. Mm -hmm. They have high status. Mm -hmm. But you see them, he says, I will do whatever it takes for me to serve one Zawar of Imam Hussein. I will put my honor aside. I will put every respect I have, even if I am the Sheikh of the Ashira, even if I am the top leader of my clan, of my tribe. For the sake of Hussein, I am ready to even let the zawar of Imam Hussein السلام, step over my head and go towards Karbala. Mm. Which I heard the year that I went to Karbala for Arba'een, the man was holding the microphone and he said, Za'ir, do not pass me. Whatever you want to do, do not pass me without stop, stopping at my mokim. Even if you want, you can put your, your feet, your shoe on my head. Now, where in the world would you be able to give me an example of such an experience? And that does not come from an empty place. Yes. That comes from the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt, There is a, a narration by uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, narrated as he was discussing, speaking with Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, and Allah says to Musa, that's way before the martyrdom of Imam Hussein mm -hmm. Allah is saying to Musa, Oh Musa, if a mu'min or if a person feeds the zuwar of Imam Hussein السلام, and spends one dirham, I will convert that into 70 dirhams. Mm -hmm. And Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam says, Min ala'im al-mu'min al-infaq wal-it'am. One of the signs of a mu'min is to spend and to feed. And then hence we have Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. They themselves used to cook food. When Imam Zain al-Abideen came back to the city of Medina, the women and the children, they, they were occupied, they were sad, they were dressed in black, they were doing matam and aza. Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, he himself used to cook for them, for the matam. Because they knew, Imam knew that they, they have a majlis. Images mm. for the women. They used to call the women of, of, of Medina and organize a matam for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Imam Zain al-Abidi used to cook for them. So this comes because our Imams, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they either themselves they used to cook for the majalis of Imam Hussein, for the zuwar or for those who used to come to the matam of Imam Hussein, or give money for people to cook. Mm. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says to his son, if I was to pass away, organize majalis for 10 years in Mina and commemorate the death of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and feed people. Mm -hmm. So when you see the people of Iraq and their millions from, from uh, Fao, from the farthest point, or from Kuwait, let's say, mm -hmm. you see from the borders of Kuwait, they start opening their doors and they start feeding people until they reach Karbala from every angle, from from Kurdistan, from Baghdad, from Najaf, from Hilla, from Simawa, from every city in, in Iraq opens its doors towards the Zuwar of Abi mm. Abdullah. I mean, I, one thing that sticks out is that um, when I went once, they, I, I kind of, it was, it was new to me, so I offered, you know, to pay and stuff, and they said, they, I asked them, what would you like? And they said, just when you get to Karbala, tell Imam that we gave you food. That's all we want. That's the only payment they require. Um, I want, to, I want to focus on this aspect of food and I want to, be, uh, I want to open up the discussion uh, Ibrahim and Sayyid Mohsin because we have to be living in an era now where climate's in trouble um, with the weather, litter, pollution and one of the big topics is food wastage as well um, and as we've been, we've seen, you know, you, you mentioned earlier there's the biggest gathering of food we've ever seen in our life Is there room for discussion and we need to talk about perhaps putting a limit on the food because men, much does get wasted or should that generosity just be as open as possible? Is, is there an issue? Maybe you guys know more than I do. Is there an issue with food wastage there? Um, is it all used or do we have to look at limiting it, putting quotas in, for example? What do you, what do you think? What do you think, Ibrahim? I think that, um, number one, we can't really expect numbers when it comes to... True. I mean, numbers go up to something like 27 million yep. in the period, not in that on one day, but the whole Arabian period. There's about 27, they call it 30 million people 
Um, so how, how do you organize food? Are you True. supposed to ration it or something? Yeah. You know, so and I think everyone has the intention as well. Don't you think, Ibrahim, that you know we want to give this food out? Definitely. If it doesn't get given or there's run out of time, that's not really the individual's fault. The the Nia was there though to to give. But one thing that they do do, so um, this is one thing I do know of, um, including for example the shrine of Imam Ali. They have a massive mokib uh, at the start of the f the, fir the first few pools after you, you pass um, the Hawli, which they call. Um, the first few pools, there, there is a big mokib. Uh, that mokib is the mokib of the shrine of Imam Ali. Now okay. they they cook unbelievable amounts of food. Their kitchen wow. is massive. You can see you can see it in pictures. The the kitchen is unbelievably big. What they do, however, is this: when they finish, for example, the cooking and they have given everything out on that specific day, whatever is left, whoever was in the kitchen. A lot of these people, they would go back to their family because they live in Najaf mm -hmm. or, or they live close to that. They'd go back to their family, so they'd give them, take to your family. Um, they'd give them for their neighbors. Oh. Yeah. So a, lo a, a, a lovely tradition you'll find in, in, in Iraqi culture, um, even in Pakistani culture, I've realized this as well. What they do is uh, if, if they've cooked some nice food, they'll yeah, make sure to go to the neighbors yes. and give them some of the food. So this is, this is a way to make sure there is uh, no wastage at all. By mm -hmm. giving to other people, you get more thawab, inshallah. As well. And adding to that, if you go back to Ahlul Bayt, again, there isn't a thing that Ahlul Bayt had missed yes. until they comment on it. Uh, when it comes to ta'am uh, al-ta'am, Imam al-Sadiq has a beautiful narration which says that لو أنفق رجل ألف درهم If one spends a thousand dirham, cooks food, prepares food and then the riwayah continues is saying وَأَكَلَ مِنْهُ مُؤْمِن Now you spend a thousand dirham, mm. you prepare a nice banquet and from that food one mu'min eats the Imam alayhi salam says, Lam ya'uddu surfan. That is not counted as wastage. Mm. Does that mean that we take that food and we throw it away? No. no. Mm -hmm. When a mu'min cooks for another mu'min, and that mu'min eats, and then there's leftover, that mu'min knows what to do. That mu'min knows mm -hmm. that he doesn't, is not allowed to throw that food away. So they will be able to take care yeah. of yeah. Uh, sorting out the food. And again, when we come to find the explanation of israf or tabdeer, yeah. Israf and tabdeer happens when you are cooking, for example, for yourself. You know, you are one person, you need to cook for one person. So, but if you cook for five people and you know there's no one else to eat with you, that is called israf and tabdeer. Yes. Or if you are cooking and that food uh, or that money that you are spending is going to be for an unjust cause, yeah. that is called israf and tabdeer. Mm -hmm. But when you are cooking for the cause of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, for a good cause, that is not counted as israf and tabdeer. Mm. And when you are cooking, you know for sure that you will need more. You will need to spend more money to cook, to bring more, more uh, quantities of, of meat and rice and whatever you need to prepare more food. Mm -hmm. There are people who buy house, they buy a house uh, uh, for their family. But before Arba'in, they sell that house. And whatever they get from selling that house, they go and buy food and, and water and, and provide the shelter. And then before everything finishes, or they know that there is a little bit more left, they say, they say this is the story we've heard, that there is an individual who sells his house every year. He buys a house, he sells it, he spends everything that he's gained from selling that house in the sake of for the sake of the Zawar of Imam Hussein. Yeah. And he doesn't go back to his family until he's spent the every, Spend. let's say, pence or cent or dinar for the sake of Imam Hussein. And he says, Sayyidna, every year, Imam Hussein alayhi salam helps me to buy another house. Mm. And every year I will sell my house and I will spend it for the Zawar of Imam Hussein. The intention is so pure. The intention is what is needed. Mm. Even if you, uh, there are, we see many images of old women or three or four children sitting, you know, on the side of the road mm. with, you know, a teapot and a few uh, stikans of chai. Even if you give one stikan of chai, yeah, it doesn't matter if you give one ton or one stikan. Mm. It's all the same. The eyes of one. What a beautiful note to end on. <coughs> uh, thank you to our, our guests for not just giving knowledge but sharing the experience because it's very very powerful uh, of the pilgrimage. And to our viewers at home for watching. Uh,
the one word that does come to my mind when I think of this pilgrimage is the word love. It is a pilgrimage of love, not just from the people that are there, but from the man they are visiting as well. Um, we hope you took a lot from the show and we hope that this has inspired you to actually go on the pilgrimage and may God grant all the viewers from all different backgrounds to witness this pilgrimage and to go on it. Uh, as per tradition with the show, we're going to end with a eulogy by Brother Ibrahim uh, to close the show. So please, Brother Ibrahim. Um, so with the gist of the show, I think um, this is more appropriate than a very uh, Masa'ib based thing. It will include some Masa'ib as well, as all the religious do, inshallah. Uh, Carry the message of Hussein is the title written by Basim al Ansari. Severed heads led a fading caravan of captive women, children, and a man. They were crushed, whipped, sworn at, and put in chain. Yet they carried the message of Hussein. Upon leaving the fields of Karbala, Zainab said, I swear by Almighty Allah that a lasting flag will rise on this plain. It would carry the message of Hussein. Countless people will come from near and far towards the flag that guides them like a star they will face all types of cruelty and pain yet they carry the message of hussein we will have the final glory and gain as we carry the message of hussein Subhanallah. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum.